Hi guys, my name is Will Collins, and I'm here to talk to you about the Centers for Excellence uh, in Digital Innovation, Digital Literacy. Um, and I'm currently with a uh, collaborator, uh, Brilliant Labs. Um, and I wanted to talk today about my experiences with digital literacy and um, career-wise kind of things that uh, I've run into and things that uh, could be done differently. So um, let me just start by going ahead and introducing myself. Uh, Again, my name is Will Collins. Um, I did my PhD in the States at Tufts in uh, pharmacology and went on to do a postdoc at uh, University of Ottawa. Um, I went on to do a career transition into kind of more educational technologies, and I actively work now on bringing biotech into a lot of the school systems throughout Atlantic Canada. Um, and so I wanted to take the time today to talk about my kind of broad career view oversight uh, and ways in which, you know, things could have gone differently or things uh, I learned from experiences. And I wanted to really talk about it in context to a concept called Ikigai, which I hope I'm pronouncing correctly, is a Japanese concept meaning reason for being. And it comprises what you love, what the world needs, what you're good at, and also what you can get paid for. Um, so, it's one of these things that, uh, especially when you're younger, you have a lot of competing interests in terms of uh, what direction you might get pulled in and how you might find kind of completing those four things of what you love, what the world needs, what you're good at, and what you can be paid for. Um, so let's see. Uh, this is going to be a little bit philosophy, a little bit uh, guidance on technical things, and I'm going to see if I can cover my... Uh, motivations, my experiences going with the flow versus going against, uh, my, you know, experiences with entrepreneurial ventures, um, knowing when to pivot, talking a little bit about burnout, and then um, doing it your own way. And then I'll kind of wrap up and, and do kind of a conclusion of everything. So um, like a lot of other students, I got through high school and then, you know, a lot of forces were telling me, oh, well, you got to go to med school or you got to go do something in the medical community. Um, and this is oftentimes uh, like something I do hear a lot and often from students, but there's kind of this question in my head about oversaturating or over over committing to a narrative that I might not be good at it, or I might not be competitive or what have you. Um, and so in undergrad, I did notice that a lot of students were, you know, their parents had told them that you got to go, you're going to be a doctor, you got to be a doctor. And um, it was just like everyone and their mother was convinced that this was the thing to do. Um, and don't get me wrong, I mean, it's certainly a feasible career path, um, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about things like the um, Labor Department um, produces statistics on career growth and these kind of things, and then talk about kind of hypersaturation in some parts of things. Um, so uh, um, the one thing I wanted to say is that, um, you know, these kind of pursuing very uh, lauded career paths are worthwhile, but then you also have to think about um, what kind of the dynamic is. So I just wanted to share a statistic that uh, roughly nine out of 10 submissions for medical schools in Canada are rejected and there remain only 17 medical schools. And while they have changed uh, the number of seats for many of the schools, the reality is, is that it's sort of capped and you could have impeccable grades, you could have uh, great fundamentals, great extracurriculars, but the reality is, is that there's just too much. Um, and so a lot of folks do wind up uh, kind of getting additional training outside of the country that could be England, Scotland, and the US, and then trying to kind of repatriate their degrees uh, but it can be sort of a, a tricky process. Um, so in some cases, this phenomena can kind of flood a labor market in which you have a lot of trained people in a particular discipline, but not enough seats for them to work into. And so many of them who are trained in the biological sciences or the medical sciences or what have you uh, may get kind of pushed down on their the wages they can compete for if they've kind of committed to a certain career path. 
Um, and I can say this from experience because I spent probably six, seven years in grad school for uh, pharmacology. Um, that being said, you know, those six, seven years, uh, I have friends that had probably put a decade or so into getting their degree, having to kind of switch PIs or, or these kind of things midway. Um, and, you know, I did find myself periodically in a circumstance in which uh, I graduated into a 2008 financial instability and uh, other shaky economic circumstances uh, in which, you know, the profession that you train for may not always be what's needed at that given time. So those concepts I talked about on uh, Ikigai of um, what is needed and what you love and what you're good at, um, those things are kind of shifting uh, day to day. So it's important to kind of keep tabs on these things. But I will mention about my experiences doing a PhD is that uh, for every one of me, there was eight to 10 hungry, motivated master students uh, that were willing to do a great deal to kind of get in a position to get the PhD positions. Um, and, you know, a lot of folks uh, from my graduating year are still actively trying to find professorships and tenure positions. Um, but the you know, it really depends how much you're willing to work to, you know, get those positions. In many cases, this will require you're having to do two to three year postdocs and uh, moving around every couple of years. And you do that, you know, I've known folks that have done postdocs for close to a decade, moving around every so often. And um, over time, uh, you know, it either doesn't take or it doesn't quite take off and you have to have kind of a, a plan B. Um, so in retrospective, I would have put a lot more of my skills into programming and digital literacy skills at the time. Um, I did wind up uh, doing a fair amount with um, kind of open source uh, bioreactor uh, initiatives and uh, really making bio as accessible as a resource as something you would have with programming resources. Um, but the reality is that a lot of grad students in the sciences, um, some of the equipment they have to work with can cost anywhere between 200 to 500K, uh, depending on your institution. Whereas if you were a grad student in something like the computer sciences or uh, mathematics, oftentimes the analogy is that they can just lock you in a room with a whiteboard and and some papers and manuscripts can come out. Uh, so almost the um, uh, the cost of capital to kind of set up uh, is is less so. And, you know, given that, um, uh, you know, only so many institutions could have like a $500,000 microscope or mass spec or what have you, um, it's important that... Um, there's kind of diversity in what you can do with those skills such that you're not kind of pigeonholed um, in a certain region. Um, I wanted to share as an important side note that the both the Canadian and U.S. labor departments do share statistics on employment numbers, including salary and growth. And so those concepts of Ikigai I had mentioned, particularly what you can get paid for and what there's need for, those things do shift and we do see these kind of um, periodic shifts in what societally we need at a given time. Um, but, you know, even if you do decide that the medical sciences are for you, um, there's a lot of ways you can kind of expand into other careers you might not have imagined in biotech and, and uh, have to be a little more creative with um, plan Bs, plan Cs, plan Ds, those kind of things. Um so I wanted to talk a little bit about experiences of going with the flow versus kind of going your own way. And um, I myself, uh, earlier on when I had gotten into college and even grad school, I had uh, been really kind of sold on this intrepid entrepreneur uh, mindset. And it's, it's a useful mindset, but it's also a thing to be cautious of sometimes um, and to really, you know, when you do leap, you, you do that knowing conviction that, um, you are capable of handling what comes your way. Um, so the phrase I always like to use is if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Meaning that, um, you know, we have these 
archetypes of uh, brilliant individuals that kind of go it alone, your Ben Franklin equivalents. But the reality is these days is that a lot of times these are more careers, but it sometimes can become almost a cult of personality where one person is out to be made as the the brilliant uh, cavalier innovator within that group. Uh, but, you know, the problem or, or challenge, I should say, is that um, uh, a lot of folks kind of wind up on the back burner. Um, so if you want to go far, go together. Um, and so I... I often kind of unfortunately boil these things down to sports analogies. So if these don't resonate with you, my apologies. But um, I, I look at um, the length of a career as really something that's more of a marathon. Folks will think of it as, you know, short interspersed sprints, but it is really more of a marathon. Um, and so in some distance and endurance sports like um, cycling, uh, there are what are called domestiques. And uh, the domestique is oftentimes a rider that's on a team that winds up doing, you know, three quarters of the race at optimum high endurance pace and everybody else kind of drafts them. Um, and they're a useful part of the team. Uh, but at the same time, the mentality can be sometimes that you get goaded into this entrepreneurial venture that you don't know if it's going to pan out, pan out business plan wise, and you don't know if you have the skills to do it at a given time. So um, I, I think it's an important distinction to make that um, sometimes your teammates or the media writ large uh, will kind of encourage this mindset um, that you should go into a, a sprint and feed your adrenaline in. But the reality is, is that, um, you know, sometimes you'll get, you know, they'll ride on your coattails or something of that sort, and you have to be very careful about burning out. Um, so it is good to take the endurance mindset. You know, that being said, um, uh, you will also see that if you're starting out in a big race of people, you don't want to get stuck behind everybody else. So it's important to push ahead to kind of set yourself apart from the pack, but not so hard that you're going to burn out hard in the first half of the race kind of thing. Um, but uh, just, you know, uh, if you have a technology or a concept or an idea that you believe in, follow it, but be careful about overzealous expectations and kind of hype or empty promises that can... Um, uh, feed into that because, uh, you know, as cool or dynamic, whatever it is you're working on, um, you'll find that, uh, you know, you, uh, you have to make financial commitments and sometimes that's, uh, you know, it might be hard on your bank account or hard on a mortgage on your house or hard on your family life and those kind of things. And so it's important to look at it as a, you know, a sprint within the larger race, but not so much that you don't have any gas in the tank. Um, so you'll find that, you know, your story of your compelling idea or concept might seem less compelling to people if you've kind of burned yourself out, um, and you're kind of at risk at, uh, crashing and burning a little bit. Um, so, you know, that being said, I, I, I do wholeheartedly encourage and, and believe in entrepreneurial ventures. Um, but sometimes these things are kind of early in conception and need a little more tinkering to really get out of beta testing. Um, and so the example I always like to give is um, uh, a group like uh, pets.com. So in the 90s, there was a huge internet boom and there was a lot of kind of emerging technologies. And um, pets.com was looking to bring dog food or cat food or whatever kind of pet food to your doorstep. Uh, but the reality at the time was that there were insufficient adopters and that the shipping and storage prices uh, for moving that kind of heavy material were not what you could get paid for. So, you know, in our modern era, we can certainly visualize and conceptualize a way in which, you know, pet food could get delivered to our door. But at the time, there had to be kind of a hard-nosed mentality about what is it going to cost us per kilogram 
uh, per unit distance and are we getting enough orders in? Um, but, you know, the other side of the coin is that if I look at an innovator like Steve Jobs, um, they were creating something that they didn't know that people wanted until they had it in their hands. And that's kind of a mentality that you have to kind of keep in mind. They don't know how badly they need the thing that you're making until it's been made and they've worked with it for a little bit. Um, so those are just, you know, two things to kind of keep in mind in terms of market fit and um, making the thing that is so compelling that people don't know until they have it in their hands that they need it. Um, but it's also important to know uh, career-wise when to make a pivot. Um, and there are circumstances in which, you know, I've heard of colleagues that have trained for many years in cartography to learning to be a map maker. And um, the reality is, is that uh, that's kind of drying up when they get there. So they have to kind of reinvent on the fly and have kind of a plan B. In this case, the plan B was learning about computer science and um, GPS systems uh, such that you could, or in this case, this individual could make a different variety of GPS systems for things that, uh, you know, they might not be conceived of by the general public. Um, it's also important to be cautious about uh, burnout and uh, feeling the feeling that if your day-to-day -day tasks are really kind of dragging on you, and you feel like you're in that long-term competitive marathon-like race, you want to be sure that you still do have some gas in the tank to kind of move move forward, because there is this phenomena of kind of moving the goalposts with uh, entrepreneurship sometimes, where you might be talking with an investor and they want you to reach these metrics, but then they want you to talk to another investor and the other investor wants you to reach these other metrics. And, you know, depending on how much gas you have in the tank, you don't want to be reaching that proverbial goalpost and then having it kind of moved on you at a given at a given time. Um, so it's important to kind of have a little more kick and be able to buck back up if uh, things don't qu go quite the way you planned. Um, but, and, you know, furthermore, it's not um, doing kind of worth doing long-term damage to your health, your financial system, your family, your community. Uh, you know, it's, it's worth doing and it's worth doing well, but it's not worth your health and sanity. Um, so I actually, uh, when I think of these things, I, I actually really like the song Frank Sinatra's I Did It My Way, um, as kind of, uh, a, a, a statement about how, you know, you have something that you feel like is like a secret that, uh, people don't know about, but they really should. And they would feel very differently about things if they knew, knew they could do it another way. Um, but, you know, there may come a point in time in your career in which you kind of reach a plateau in which the amount of work you're putting in is not commensurate with uh, whatever your financial gain thereof. Um, and so we had this joke in grad school about grad students is that uh, they were kind of like a dog and you got to feed the dog just enough that the dog is not going to starve but not so much that it gets husky or it hard, starts having ideas about its own independence. And that was kind of the policy with grad students is that uh, PhD actually stands for uh, poor, helpless, and desperate. And uh, kind of having to break this mindset of, oh, I got to get the grants so that I can get maybe 5 to 10% of it to pay for my salary and work really hard. Um, and keep in mind in this dog and owner scenario, the owner might decide to stop feeding the dog at any point in time. Maybe it decides that it's not their favorite dog or something of that sort. But um, it's important to not be in a circumstance in which uh, you, as that proverbial dog, uh, could stop be being fed tomorrow. Um, and then you know, if you think about what your burn rate is, uh, how quickly can you kind of get back on your feet and to stay that way? So that's one of the things about our modern era about independence is that um, 
if one revenue stream dies out suddenly, it's important to kind of have redundancy and important to have, I hate using the phrase side hustle because it, it just sounds like um, a rise and grind the archetype. But um, it's important to be able to pivot and know what you're going to do in case things go sideways on you. Um, so I, as for myself, I mean, I honestly think that digital literacy is one of those tools that's really indispensable across multiple varieties of careers. Um, and I myself, I had tried and done a little bit of programming. I didn't quite have the aptitude for kind of digging for semicolons versus colons and um, those kind of things. But uh, the applications thereof, I, I mean, I for for biomedical engineering applications or these kind of things, you know, knowing how to make stuff, uh, knowing that you have sufficient self integrity and and um, wherewithal to be able to do things if you know your back was against the wall and you need to figure them out, those kind of confidence aspects are essential to have, um, and uh, having a little bit of overlap with the entrepreneur community, I think it's wholeheartedly worthwhile to have good mentorship when you go launching things on your own or, or taking your own direction. Um, for instance, you know, even Bill Gates worked for some time at the Xerox Corporation uh, before launching Microsoft. And it's important to kind of lo learn about how an industry works before launching off on your own and ensuring that you also have a good team to kind of back you too. Um, and a lot of entrepreneurs do wind up, you know, succeeding or sometimes they fail multiple times before succeeding, but it's, it's very important not to have it as something that jeopardizes your health uh, or personal relationships um, in such a way that it would be difficult for you to come back from it. Um, so uh, the key takeaway is, um, I would say about the phenomena of Ikigai, what you love, what you're good at, what you can get paid for, and what people need. Keep in mind those things in context to Labor Statistics Bureau and, you know, what you can contribute. And then, you know, always be ready to pivot or move in different directions. Um, so that's kind of uh, the extent of what I, what I wanted to cover. Um in future talks, potentially I can talk more about uh, ways in which digital literacy can overlap with the health sciences or things of that sort. Okay, bye for now, guys.